Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, are about leadership, personal growth, and creating a superior culture of excellence, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today came super close to death, surviving a shark attack near the Lanikai Beach area. And he's truly inspiring, and you'll see why. He is Tony Lee, and today we are going beyond adversity. Hey, Tony, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Hi, Rusty. Now, Tony, I know that you grew up in Tennessee and you came to Hawaii around 10 years ago, uh, but tell me about the sports you played uh, growing up. Well, when I was growing up, my, my father's originally from Argentina, so uh, I grew up playing soccer and, uh, you know, soccer was, uh, 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 I, I, you know, it was my whole being all the way through, through uh, high school and then I was able to go to Georgia Tech uh, and play soccer at Georgia Tech. Uh, and so, yeah, up until, and even after Georgia Tech, I, I had hoped to go, you know, to, to something beyond that to try to try out for some pro teams. But, uh, but as soon as I got to Georgia Tech, you know, Tennessee is a small state. And, uh, and it, all through high school, I was, uh, I, you know, I felt I was a very good player. But then once I got to Georgia Tech and started to play with the, some of those Division One athletes, I started realizing that I had no chance going pro, which, uh, you know, so... After college, I, I went on to a career in, in biomedicine, but uh, but yeah, I, I soccer was my whole my whole life when I was growing up. Oh, that's so cool! You know, I did soccer too. It's a ton of running. I mean, and and you mentioned about yeah. you know biotech, and you, you founded a company called Igenix. What what does that company do? So uh, Igenix, we we work we have built a biosynthetic cornea. Uh, so there are about 15 million people in the world who are blind due to only their corneas. And uh, the only solution to restore sight to those folks is uh, up until our company was transplant. Um, but transplant has a lot of difficulty to it. You know, first of all, the, the corneas have to be harvested within one hour of death and they can only uh, be sustained for about a week, uh, sometimes two weeks. Um, but either, but because of that, uh, there were only about uh, 60 to 70,000 transplants available per year. And so you can see if there's 15 million people who need transplants, but only 60 to 70,000 available, that leaves a lot of people in the dark, figuratively and literally. Um, and so what our company did is we found a way to grow a cornea in a lab. Um, we're using a recombinant gene technology, and we have built a scaffold of collagen and which we implant to the patients, and the patient's own cells grow into it. So uh, this becomes a part of the patient and uh, you know, the long-term results are very, very promising. Wow, that's super interesting. And, and Tony, you know, let's, let's go right into uh, that big, uh, the day in October of 2015. Can you take me, tell me about what happened on that day? Sure. Uh, my friend Maz and I had, uh, we were training for a triathlon and so as part of our training, we would swim to the Mok. The Mokaleles are two islands that uh, are about a mile offshore uh, from uh, Lanikai Beach. And so we swam to the island, and we were on our way back. Um, when you leave the island, there's a really good cross current. And so uh, the, the key is you can't stop during while you're coming off the island. Uh, otherwise, you get, you get washed down, downstream. Uh, so you have to wait until you get to the middle channel. Uh, and so... Naz and I had gotten separated. Uh, we were probably about 100 yards apart coming off the island. Um, and I made it to the middle channel first. And so I was just kind of hanging out in the middle channel waiting for Maz to, to catch up. And, you know, I was swimming at a really slow pace and just kind of looking at the coral and hanging out. And I felt a, a lar just a, a very violent grab on both my legs. Uh, and at first, you know, I honestly thought it might have been Maz, you know, catching up with me and just grabbing my legs. Uh, and then I looked, and then I felt uh, just um, just this horrendous pain. I mean, it, 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 I, it's hard to describe uh, how it just it shot through my legs. And I looked back and I just saw teeth. Um, and the shark just had both of my legs in, in her mouth. Uh, and I remember I was trying to punch, uh, you know, using my fist to punch behind me. Um, 
And I grabbed a good breath of air, and she started to force me deep into the water. Um, I remember we, we, my eardrums shattered, uh, you know, because we, we, we just dove so fast. I didn't have time to clear my ears. Um, and I kept punching and punching, but it, it wasn't doing anything. Uh, eventually, when uh, my legs, one of my legs came off. And so it, it, it allowed me to turn around and face the shark. So I, I grabbed her by the snout and tried to keep her away from me while I was punching her and punching her gills. Um, and I can tell you, punching doesn't really work. Uh, it, it's not going to stop a shark. Um, and then I saw her eyes. And, um, you know, I, I told you about my business. We do biosynthetic corneas. One of the things we do in, uh, when we have a new prototype, uh, we take pig eyes and we practice uh, the surgery on the pig eyes and we practice inserting the uh, the corneas there uh and the pig anatomy is very similar to the shark anatomy they have what's called a nicotine membrane which is a third eyelid so the eyelids close and then there's a third eyelid that goes across and this eyelid is for protection that's why like when when dogs try to pay, tra uh, ch chase pigs through the brush uh the pig is never hurt but sometimes dogs lose their corneas you know because the brush tears away at their eyes um and so uh and I knew that, that the nicotine membrane is very strong if you push it this way, but you can just slide it like this and it slides right off. So uh, I did just as we did to the pigs. I just opened her eyes, slid the nicotine membrane, and pushed my fingers into the medial aspect here, and the eyeball popped right out. So I just ripped her eyeball right out, and then uh, and then she left me alone. Um, so I started swimming back to the surface, and I, boy, I, you know, I didn't realize how deep we were. Uh, I just remember it taking, uh, you know, I was stroking and stroking and trying to get up, trying to get up. And, uh, and I, and, and the surface was so far away. I, 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 it's hard to tell how deep we were, but when I uh, finally got to the surface, um, <laughs> I remember I was treading water and yelling for help and looking around and I couldn't see anyone. And all of a sudden a, a foot floated next to me. And I thought, oh, somebody lost a foot out here. And, and I realized it was my own foot. And so I just put it into my uh, swim trunks and, uh, and then started to, and I realized there was no one around. So I started to swim back to shore. Um, but I knew I needed to, I knew I wasn't going to make it because we were over half a mile from shore. So I needed to swim backstroke so I could keep yelling while I swam. So I, I swam backstroke and, and was yelling the whole time, help, help, help. And you know, just miraculously out of the blue, um, uh, Charlie Liverton and his son, or Julia Liverton and his son Charlie, uh, heard me, and uh, they were out uh, on these uh, these um, uh, these uh, kayak these uh, race kayaks, and uh, they came by and picked me up. Um, Julian picked me up, and you can see from the picture there that's uh, that's Julia, that's me on Julian's boat, and then Charlie went to go pick up my friend Maz. Um, and, you know, we're really lucky Charlie was there that day because um, Julie and I, I, I kept struggling with breathing and, and those boats are so tippy that, uh, and I didn't have legs at the time. So I, I kept kind of, we kept falling over, we kept capsizing the boat. Uh, but uh, um, Charlie was able to grab Maz and they headed to shore uh, immediately. Uh, later on, I heard from the, the, para, the, the paramedics that uh, there's only a few um, ambulances on the whole west side of on the whole east side of the island and the last ambulance had or the second to last ambulance had been called out and and when julian when they received the 911 call from uh, julian uh they only had one ambulance there and two minutes later that ambulance was called to the to the north shore and so if charlie hadn't made it to shore um that much earlier uh then then that ambulance would have been headed to the north shore and and i would i'd be dead for sure um, so, uh, so yeah, it's amazing. Charlie was only 14 years old at the time and, uh, he was really able to, to, um, to, 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 to save my life. I mean, by, by getting to shore so fast. Tony, how much, how much blood did you lose during that whole time? And then during the time in the ambulance going to Queens? Yeah, as soon as I got to shore, they were able to put a tourniquet on me. But by that time, uh, I was having a lot of trouble breathing. Um, and uh, the doctors in the ER uh, said that a guy that's normally my size has about five and a half liters of blood in him. And uh, they were they put uh, nine liters of blood in me. 
so I guess, you know, I was almost completely desaguinated by the time I got to the, uh, the ER. Um, Jeez. You know, when I was in the hospital, when I was in the, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, when I was in the ambulance, I, you know, there's statistics out there that when you're in an accident, uh, the minute the ambulance arrives, your chance of survival goes up to 50%. And when, the minute you make it to the ER, your chances of survival goes to 95%. And so I knew those statistics, and I knew that the key to my survival was just to stay alive until I got to the hospital. And so the whole time, in the, and uh, you know, when I was waiting for the ambulance or when I was in the back of the ambulance, I remember I just needed to stay awake and cognizant. And so I was doing number sequences, and uh, Fibonacci sequences, what I used to do to kind of you know, just run my brain. And so I just kept running uh, Fibonacci sequences through my head because I knew I just needed to stay conscious and needed to stay awake. Um, as soon as I saw the awning at Queens, uh, that's, I just passed out then. And I just let the darkness take me because I knew that I had 95% uh, chance of survival at that point. So, Tony, you know, what, what was it like when you're lying in the hospital bed? What was your mental state like when you're, when you're in that hospital room? The first two weeks were kind of tough. Uh, I had a lot of tubes running in and out of me, and they were keeping me sedated. So I was just kind of in and out of consciousness. Um, and, and then the next three weeks, uh, they had done uh, a lot of fixation. They, they had, they had uh, taken the foot that I recovered, and they had reattached it to my, uh, to my leg. And, uh, and then they had put uh, metal bars in there uh, to uh, kind of fixate it, to hold it all in place. And so for the first three weeks, uh, I had to stay very still because any movement would cause, you know, the, the leg to misalign. So that, that, was, that was by far the toughest time, uh, sitting there uh, for three weeks, not being able to move at all. Um, but once I got out of that, uh, my, uh, uh, I was able to get into a wheelchair for the first time. And I remember after uh, five weeks of just being in the hospital and, you know, looking at the roof or the ceiling there, it, it was so amazing to be able to see the sunlight. Uh, and uh, it just, just, it was, it was amazing. Um, yeah. That's a, and uh, one of my good, and so that we got back to the hospital bed and um, one of my uh, good friends, Dell, he had met a guy a few years early, a guy named Tom Lee. And Tom had, was a soldier in the, in the, in army, in the army. And he had, uh, his uh, Humvee had been uh, hit by an IED in Iraq, and he had lost uh, one of his legs and uh, partially, and his his other leg was salvaged. And uh, Tom walked into my my uh, hospital room, and you know, and he started chatting with me. And then he pulled up his pant leg and showed me his prosthetic leg, and he said, "You know what? It's not so bad. Um, you uh, you could you, I I you know I live a really normal life." Uh, you can too, and I, that was uh, that was so important to me. I, I was at uh, such a such a rough part of my life, and uh, just wondering what my life would be now that I I didn't have uh, legs. And uh, and uh, seeing uh, Tom that day, and knowing that uh, that 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 there was life after amputation, um, that was uh, that was a really important day. Tony. You're the father and son that rescued you. They came to visit you in the hospital. What was it like seeing them again in the hospital this time? Uh, it was uh, it was great to see Julian and Charlie. And and over the years we've kept in touch. Uh, we've, we've you know been able, oh the person on the right of that photo that that's that's Mad. That's the the guy that was swimming with me that day. Um, and uh, Julia and Charlie are, are just great people. Uh, they they live they still live in Monikai. Well, I, I actually Charlie's off to college now, but uh, they're they uh, you know, we stay in contact. A few uh, uh, and a few months ago, we 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 all went up to the North Shore, and uh, the uh, Ocean Ramsey runs an amazing uh, shark uh, uh, a swim a swim with the sharks program up there. Uh, the, her and her partner Juan are, are, are conservationists and shark enthusiasts. And they brought us up all up there, and we got a chance to swim with with uh, with a lot of the different sharks. And um, it, it was really an amazing experience. And to be able to share that with Julie and Charlie was 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 wonderful. 
Oh, you know, I had Ocean Ramsey on my TV show a few months ago and, and yeah, what her and Juan are doing, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, just the yeah. education about sharks and, and how they're really not interested in humans, but what did, um, yeah. what, Tony, what did Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors do uh, for you <laughs> while you were in the hospital? Well, I, you know, it was, it was a great that I was back in 2015 and was doing one of their championship uh, seasons. And I, I've been a season ticket holder for a number of years. And I've just been a really big Warriors fan. And when the uh, the Warriors heard of what happened to me, that they, they was fantastic. They just Seth sent me a jersey, a signed jersey, and he sent me a whole box of, of shirts and uh, of, of you know, Warriors shirts. And so I, uh, I was able to spread them around the floor because it was right around the time where they were uh, the season was starting, and so uh, so every time a Warriors game came on on the on the hospital floor, we the whole floor would just stop and we'd all go watch the game together. We'd all put on our shirts, and uh, it was uh, it, yeah, it was great. That yeah, I really appreciate the Warriors reaching out to me, and uh, and it was really nice of Steph to sign a jersey for me. Oh, that's so cool to hear that they did that. I mean, <laughs> I, I like hearing things like that, and. And Tony, I, I want to ask you this, you know, while, you know, after being in the hospital, were you experiencing any PTSD at all? Yeah, uh, right, right after, during, while I was in the hospital, uh, my company, was, my company was a startup and I was undergoing a funding round. And so we were, uh, we were very busy at that moment. And immediately after the hospital, uh, I had to get on an, an airplane pretty quickly pretty soon after that and um and go see some of my investors and and, and try to fix, try to close that funding round and so it was so busy that that i really didn't have time to really kind of process a lot of it and it wasn't until almost a year maybe two years later that i started having some pretty bad nightmares and um and and you know i, I would wake up sometimes and just you know and just be drenched with sweat and and i i could relive the shark attack in my in, in my nightmares um and uh it, it took a little while to get over that uh, one of the things i tried was uh, was was uh was try uh, a friend of mine at, at stanford uh had a, a program where they they were using lsd to kind of try to um look at or try to to help people with ptsd um uh, uh, come to terms with, with some of the the memories and some of the the, the bad feelings and I tried it out and it, it actually worked very well. It's it's really interesting how uh, I guess when it's properly used, um, uh, it allows you to to it kind of separates you from the emotion and the um, and uh, I guess the panic and the, um, the the fear that that's involved in that moment. And so it allows you to kind of relive those moments or, or remember those moments without feeling the emotion that's attached to it. And um, because a lot of times that emotion can, can that emotion, that, 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 that primal fear can really, really just overwhelms everything else. And so when you start thinking back on the attack, when I started thinking back on the attack, uh, that emotion would just overwhelm all the other feelings and, and it made it very difficult to kind of analyze um, what was happening. And so, um, so uh, LSD really helped that, and uh, we, we we did it one time, and it was uh, it was very useful, and it allowed me to kind of go relive the and uh, re, re remember and relive the entire attack um, without having that those intense emotions attached to it, and uh, it really helped me process uh, what happened. Well, that's fascinating to hear that, and and Tony, I know that you just finished reading my book. And uh, yeah. it, what what stood out to you when you're reading it when, when you're reading the books? You know, I'll tell you one of the biggest things that, that and it was pretty early on in your book. You talked about the three cons, and yep. I can tell you one of the biggest things in out there is consistency. It's building daily habits, and when you're coming back from from getting knocked down, um, and that's what I feel like when with the shark attack. I feel like I was just knocked down pretty hard. And but when you're coming back, it's it's not the you know everyone likes to see when when you know when you you have a really good result. But what they don't see is it's the day to day. It's the all the little. It's you know being able to 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 uh, get off the you know the bed, get out of your bed. It's it's able to stand up. It's 
when your leg is hurting and it's 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 that day to day uh every day uh, uh that really leads to those big moments and and that's something that 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 is not often seen uh, but that's what makes all the difference and i'm sh- and and it it makes a difference not just in in recovering from a from a um uh, from an injury it makes a difference in sports. It makes a difference in life. It makes a difference in your career. It's that day-to-day consistency. Get out there, and uh, and then you ended your book with saying that your one percent rule. Try to be one percent better every day, and and that is a that's a, that's a that's a great thing. I you know I've never heard it put like that, but I think that is exact. That is a great way to put it. You know, you're just trying to be just a little bit better each day, and and keep striving. Uh, you know, I'm not into those big accomplishments. What I'm into is that day to day, you know, striving and keeping things moving, keeping things, keep keeping things going forward. And that's how those big accomplishments occur. You know, if you just keep your, your mind all the time on the big accomplishments, sometimes you'll be disappointed because they, they make the big things may not happen. But it's that day to day that 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 really makes uh, makes it all worth it. Yeah, it's a little victories lead to big victories right there. Yeah, and, and that's how you do yeah. it is through the 1% principle. I, I love that, that that stood out to you. And Tony, I, I know that you, you know, since the shark attack, I mean, you do a lot of surfing. I mean, <laughs> you, how often yeah. do you go surfing? I'm probably there three. I'm, I'm out at, I'm usually out at Queens or canoes, uh, mostly canoes, probably about, uh, Three to four days a week, uh, and now with the uh, with the swells on the North Shore, so we we probably get up to uh, the North Shore Lonnie's or uh, Chun's probably once a week. Um, it's a little bit of a drive, but but it's it's really great to be out there. Um, you know, at being out being outdoors, being um, uh, doing sports, doing athletics has always been a really important part of my life. It's it's a part and part of my mental health. Uh, and so right away, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, my background is as an engineer. So right away, I started designing different legs to be able to do different sports. I started realizing that the amputee community was all about being able to walk. And being able to walk is very important because um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really important for daily life. But I wanted to go beyond that. I wanted to be able to rock climb. I wanted to be able to surf. I wanted to be able to ski. Um, and I realized that there really weren't legs out there for that. And so uh, I started uh, with a couple of engineering friends. We started designing different legs to do different things. And so, you know, in that surfing picture, you, you, you can kind of see it. It's a little uh, occluded by the wave, but you can see that the, the leg, the surfing leg that I designed back there, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's more of a bare metal kind of leg. It allows me to turn the surfboard and, and, uh, and, and you know, kind of turn, that, turn the board into the wave. Um, and then uh, you know, I have, I have uh, skiing legs and uh, legs for rock climbing. Um, yeah, it, it, it's been kind of a hobby of mine to kind of try to try to make all these different legs. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and then I have other friends who are amputees and, and being able to share these legs with these with my friends. No, so I, I know that you do a lot of hiking and rock climbing, like you said. Where, where have you gone to do a bunch of these, uh, <laughs> these adventures? Well, for the last uh, uh, you know six months with COVID and everything, uh, like uh, rock climbing, we 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 often go to Makapu, uh, around near uh, near the lighthouse over there. There's a uh, there's a um, there's some uh, uh, anchors set up on the rock wall there, and it's a great place to climb. Uh, hiking, we, we we hike all over the island. Uh, you know, uh, I, I try to stay away from the really really rough hikes. Uh, that picture there is from Antelope Canyon in uh, in Utah. Uh, I took some time. This was in 2019 before COVID hit up, and I just uh, spent some time uh, hiking and camping in uh, in Utah and Arizona and uh, Nevada, and um, and you know up on Bryce Canyon and uh, and Mount Z- and, and Zion National Park. It's it's really gorgeous out there. I, I recommend to all your viewers that if they get a chance, um, it, you know it, it's because it, I know everyone in Hawaii goes to Las Vegas, um, and Las Vegas is great. But if you rent a car and you just start driving north uh, for about two hours, you're gonna or three hours, you're gonna hit uh, Zion National Forest, and it is so worth it. It is gorgeous. And if you just keep going another hour more to the uh, east, you're gonna hit uh, Bryce Canyon, another thing that's absolutely amazing. And so, on your next trip to to Las Vegas, hopefully you can take a day or two off and and, and get up there and, and see some of uh, God's wonderful creation. Uh, Tony, you mentioned earlier that that you also did do skiing, and 
how yeah. how easy or hard was it for you to really learn how to adapt to ski again? Actually, skiing was pretty easy because when you ski, you wear uh, ski boots that, that fix your ankles. Uh, so my biggest problem is that, that I don't have ankles anymore. Uh, my, my, so my, both of my, with my prosthetics, uh, my feet stay at like a 90 degree angle and I'm not able to. And so with skiing, that's kind of perfect because, you know, having your ski, having your legs locked in one angle uh, actually benefits you. Um, and so what I did is I, remo- I took, uh, that, that's one of the early prototypes. My newer prototypes, um, I, I removed the boot completely. So I just have a leg that just clicks directly into the, to the ski boot. And that makes things lighter. It makes things easier. It makes me more agile out there. Um, you know, actually, surfing was a little harder than skiing because with surfing, you actually need your ankles to be able to uh, move the board. And so I try to adapt to that by um, having, uh, by, by, instead of being able to move my ankles, now I move my feet. And that's how I'm able to turn the board. Um, it's a little bit slower. It's a little bit more cumbersome, but, I, but it still allows me to make turns and, and, uh, and control the board. Um, oh, that makes sense. And, and I know that, that you also do cycling as well. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, you know, I, I, uh, there's a the great, the Honolulu bike league, uh, HBL has, uh, two great races every year. They do a, a North shore, uh, a metric century, and then they do a, a, a South shore, a full century. And so that, that picture is taken from, uh, the century that was done, uh, that's in Kapiolani park. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, I trained for that. This was, uh, about two years after I got out of the hospital or, 18 months after I got out of the hospital, I, I started training for that, and uh, I developed a special leg that that where that allowed me to clip right into the cycle. The, the challenge there is um, with most people, um, if you look at the cleats on a cycle, they're put where the uh, the toe box is, and that's because you um, cycling counts on a lot of calf muscle work. And uh, you know, if you look at like professional cyclists, they have huge calf muscles, and that's because the calf does a lot of work as you're trying to get up hills. Um, but with amputees, you don't have that cap. And so the problem with having the, the, uh, the cleat, uh, the, the pressure point over at the toe is that, you know, you're pushing from here and, and you're, you know, and the, the weight is being translated here. And so you're losing a lot in that. And so the key was to move the cleat underneath, you know, where your ankle comes down and it's much more efficient. Um, you know, especially if you don't, if you, if you don't have calf, that's the, probably, I think the most efficient way to ride a bike. And so I had to design my own leg for that. Uh, and, but my, my first few genera- my first few iterations of that leg were, were kind of rough because it was just a cleat on the end of a, of a of kind of a stick. And it was like a peg leg, you know, like the old pirates. But that turned out to be really slippery. And I ended up falling on my butt, you know, numerous times whenever I got off my bike. And so I had to kind of develop, uh, you know, uh, uh, a kind of a, a toe and a heel to go behind it. Uh, so every one of these these legs that you have to design takes a couple of different iterations. You have to design one, play with it, test it out for a little while, and then go back to the drawing board to make the changes you need, and then bring out the next generation. Um, but you know it's it's a lot of fun, and and uh, it allows me to get out there uh, and do things. Lucky thing you're an engineer, and and Tony, I want to ask you one <laughs> yeah. more thing before we wrap up. What advice do you have for all of us? Well, I, I, you know, I was just going to say a few things that, uh, that, uh, uh, when I was in the hospital, uh, or when, when on the day of the attack, I had lost a lot of blood and, um, and, you know, they put uh, nine liters of blood in me. That's nine people who had donated blood that saved my life. And so, um, if you get a chance if, and if you're able to, um, please donate blood because it, it really does save lives. I mean, it saved my life. Uh, and on a side note, if you hear that ambulance coming on the road, get out of the way. I mean, I, yesterday I just saw some people just, you know, trying to race that ambulance and get out of the way. There's someone in there that really needs to get to the hospital. Um, but, uh, but more general advice, I think uh, a lot of the concepts that you laid out in your book, um, and I really adhere to the, the consistency and that one percent rule. It, it that all the battles are always won before the war starts, it, and um, it, it it's won because of preparation, 
because of all the things that you do on a daily basis that get you to that mount point. It, it, it's not the glory moments. It's the moments that you're by yourself and, and, and fighting through your own issues as you need to. But it, it, it's those moments that, 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 that win the day. And so that's the advice I give folks. It, it's that day-to-day -day consistency. Tony, great advice. And I want to thank you for sharing your story on the show with me today. Oh, I'm happy to do it, Russ. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Tony and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.